All right, good morning. Welcome to week two of Comp 1511, our third lecture. Uh, sorry, there's just a few technical hiccups. I think Tom is joining us this morning. He's just. Yep, I'm here. Ah, and Tom's just made it in by Teams. Excellent. All right, so where are we? We had a tute lab last week. Various people had problems coming to the course late, couldn't figure out how to get to their Blackboard room, whatever, things like this. Do your tutor lab ex do sorry do your lab exercises submit your lab exercises talk to your tutor we don't penalize people for, for anything that goes wrong in week one so if you haven't done the week one lab exercises do them do them as soon as possible email your tutor let them know what's happening if you go go to the class homepage there's a timetable there which can help you find your tutor's emails. Uh, you should have an email from me this morning which has links to the class homepage. Another very important place it has links to is the course forum. You should have an invitation to the course forum. Have we sent out one, Tom, to people who've joined the course in the last day or two, or how does that work? Uh, that's a good question. I'll go through the list, maybe after this lecture, I'll go through the list of people who haven't joined so, yet, and I'll make sure that they get so an email. If, you, if you've joined in the last few days, check your email later today. We, you, Tom should be able to get an email to you, at you inviting you to the course forum. Everyone should visit the course forum at once and log in, because we, as 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 the term goes on, we, some announcements we're going to, just going to put out to the course forum. Less important things. If it's absolutely crucial, we'll also drop it in your email, which is the official UNSW you know, communication means. But I still go to the course forum um, every week. There'll be a tute lab, except week six. So there is tutes and labs up now, and every week they're due Monday. Is it five o'clock, six o'clock? I think. Um, we put I think it's eight, 8 p.m. That's eight o'clock. There you go, an extra couple of hours. We put we put the deadlines in every tutor and lab. So whatever's there goes. We had just have one sort of effectively database of these things. So you don't have to. The best place to do is look at the actual web page because it has the exact time in there. This week's tutor and lab. Last week's is a bit of a getting to know you, getting to know how to set up, getting to know how to get to VLab and things like this. This week's tutor lab, we get into a bit of coding. Um, a bit more serious coding. Um, we're working with if statements. We'll get onto loops on in Thursday's lecture. We're working with if statements. We've got some challenge exercises this week, and it, it's, it's a typical mix of challenge exercises. Some of them, if you're coping okay with a course, the first challenge exercises aren't that hard. They, they, they take a little bit of thinking, a bit of coding. Uh, the last challenge exercise is is a is a is a really interesting one. Yeah, see if you can solve it. Uh, it's, but you wouldn't be at all worried if you can't do the last challenge exercise. You'll probably find plenty of your tutors couldn't do that challenge exercise when they were doing the course, and they got really good results in the course. So it's worth noting that it's it, that one is more of a, a sort of problem solving exercise. You know, using the tools that you've been given. You'll find that in future weeks, the challenge exercises become um, sort of uh, slightly different in what they're what they're asking you to do, where there might be. Um, uh, more alg algorithmic problems to solve, possibly, or other types of problems that you might be asked to solve. But these ones are very much just a sort of. Um, oh no! Now I'm too loud this time. Um, oh. uh, apparently, I'm too loud. Oh, you are too. Sorry. Can you say something again, Tom? While I wind down your DB. Yep. Sure. This is me testing oh. again. No, wait. Technical difficulties. Yeah, Sorry. I've, ch I've changed what I was using. I was. I'm, I'm on my phone today rather than being on my computer. Um, Anyhow, yes, so so I'd really encourage people to try out these um, challenge exercises because they're not just the sort of thing where, you know, if you've never programmed before, it's impossible to do. They're actually quite doable. They're, there's some tricks to them. There's some problem solving, but they're a good one to try. I apologize for making Tom ridiculously loud. Um, oh. By the way, that's we talked about representation problems a little, how there's a fixed range of integers and even a limited range of doubles, floating point numbers you could represent. The horrible sounds you heard there was Tom's audio going to volumes beyond the range that could be represented by the audio format. So, uh, and it produces well discontinuity. If you study calculus, discontinuities occur. Your Tom's audio became non-differentiable at various points there, which produces the horrible noise. But it's also a representation problem. Uh, and do they use ints or doubles for audio? And the answer is they do actually do both, but much more often ints. Uh, you can research that if you like. 
Okay, a couple more things. So what was crucial for you to get done in week week one? Um, you have to be set up to write programs. So you can come into our labs if you have an online tute lab, uh, sorry, a face-to-face -face tute lab and write them there. But really, you want to be able to code outside those hours anyway. And unless you live near campus, yeah, you can't come to our tute labs regularly anyway, um, beyond your scheduled class. Um, so you want to be set up where you live to code. The easiest way we've said is VLAB. Get set up with a VNC client. We like Tiger VNC, but there's a pile of them out there on your laptop or perhaps desktop. So you can, from your comfort of your home, connect to CSE and write C programs. So if you didn't get set up to do that last week, it's crucial you do it this week. So get your tutor to help you with that. If they've got particular problems, you can also ask on the course forum, you know, Tiger VNC and Mac version Y is not playing nice. So there's probably someone who sold it for you and I can help you out with that as well. But you've got to be set up this week to write programs at home because what's the key to success in this course? Writing lots and lots of programs. Getting a tute question and, and playing with it, trying it out, trying variations, make sure you understand how things work. All right, there's one thing more thing I want to talk about. Yeah, and I didn't do very well in the lectures last week. There are sort of this different um, time scales for importance of things we talk about. So there were very there are lots of important things I was mentioning in last week's lecture. Some of them were important because you needed them in either in, in this week's tute lab. So things can be important because we're about to you we are about to have you write programs that involve them. So you need to use them in the next few days. Other things are important because you need them to get through Comp 1511. So there are things that will be important later on in later weeks. So we cover them because you're going to need them in a few weeks time. There are still other things that are important, but they're really important for later courses or we're starting off on a journey towards what every computer science student needs to know by the time they graduate. So I'll try to be better about making it clear what, what the time scale of importance is. Because if, if something's important for this week's Tute Lab, yeah, you want to go across it now. If it's just something that's important for, for the course, you, it, you don't need to panic if you haven't understood it today. You can come back to it on the weekend or in a week or two. And if it's important before you graduate, yeah, you, you can wait. And this has come up a bit because it, we, we've been looking at bits and representations and some parts of C that you actually don't, we, we cover properly in Comp 1521. Many of you will do Comp 1521 next term or the following term. So there's some things you'll, you'll talk about there. Tom, do I have any general general topics I should be mentioning at this point or anything other else of general interest about the course? Uh, not as of this week. The only thing I'd say is just that a, a reminder that weekly tests aren't on this week. So if you're worried at all, if you just joined the course and you've heard, oh, we've got weekly tests and you haven't seen them, please don't worry. They'll happen later. We'll talk about them in the week three lecture. Uh, I also, I'm not sure whether you're intending to show your face or your screen. If you are sh intending to show your face, then uh, well done. If you're not, then you might want to fix that. I was intending to show my... F it seems a bit insulting, really, uh, Tom. But um, yes, I was intending to show my face. Well, I'm truly sorry. <laughs> um, all right. Um, Yes, I was intending to show my face there, just so you had a good a good idea what I look like. Thank you. It is actually very helpful having Tom there because I, it, it's it's hard to track what's going out and what isn't, and and so on. So, um, all right. So let's recap. I'm gonna. I, I want to recap a few things from last week. It's helpful for those of you who came who come in late, and plus I want to highlight the importance of a few things. So we we talked about. Um, representation um, and how everything comes down to bits. In modern computers everything comes down to bits. It's all zeros and ones, binary digits, which in the hardware are on or off or maybe a, a voltage or a, a current flowing a particular way. We don't need really to worry about that. We, everything comes to zero or ones. The other, the other fundamental concept here was in, we tend to work with fixed size chunks of bits in C. And you've already heard this perhaps if you've heard about 32-bit systems or 64-bit systems, um, and that's referring to the, 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 the chunk size for quantities that those systems work with. 
that it's really a comp one five two one topic, but there are some things that don't don't make a lot of sense unless you have at least an inkling of what's happening underneath. All right, we saw variables, a place a computer can store a value, and as a program execution goes on, it may store different values at a, in a particular variable. So it's it's. It's called a variable because it value, its value can change as through time. We saw just two types of variable. Every C variable has to have a type. If you've programmed in Python, more than a few of you have programmed in Python, Python variables aren't typed. Well, not in, not, not in this way anyway. C variables ha have a type. And we saw just two types. There are more. We'll get through a few more in upcoming weeks, don't worry. We saw a special type called int, int. And that's the other thing we're seeing. There are special words in C programs which ha have special meaning. So int means it's for storing whole numbers. And we've said on CSC computers and a lot of general purpose computers, the chunk size for ints is 32 bits. And so it, that sets out the range of integers it, it, it effectively can represent. And we've said it went from roughly 2 billion down to negative 2 billion, which is a lot of programs. If you want to talk about whole numbers, don't need numbers outside that range. So we can work just fine with ints. But it's important to remember there is, is always a range there. And we, as we heard with Tom's audio, going outside the range, bad things can happen. Double is for fractional numbers like 3.14159, which often get called floating point numbers. It was for sort of a historical reason. Uh, you don't need to worry about it too much, but it's just not not reals, not whole numbers. 64 bits, which rep, let's have a lot of different patterns. Let's just rep, represent a lot of floating point numbers exactly. Unfortunately, there's an infinite number of floating point numbers in, in, in any sub interval. So you go from 0 to 0 0.1, there's an infinite number of floating point numbers. So we often have to approximate with floating point numbers. Don't worry too much about that. For the programming we'll do, everything will just work. But it's just something to bear in mind about what's underneath. And early in comp 1521, we'll go right into that and show you every bit of a floating point number and how it really works, which is interesting, very interesting. Names. Names are a thing that are going to come up over and over again. Names are actually, some people think, and I agree, are one of the hardest things in computer science, choosing good names. So we have to choose names for our variables. And we, we, we do a couple of things here. We have to remember that there's two sorts of entities looking at our program. One is a C compiler that's translating our C program to something that can be executed. It's It, it wants a legal C program. But it doesn't care much about how you choose your names. As long as you give the variable one name, it doesn't care what that name is. Humans reading a program, on the other hand, are going to really struggle. If you called your variables v1, v2, v3, through to v1000, a human's not going to be able to look at your program and work, figure out what v7 stores. So we choose names like diameter, for example, that a human can understand that a human looking at your program. And I, when I say a human, this could just be future you in you know a week or two's time if you have to come back and work on your program. Or maybe a day or two's time if it's the assignment. For, for, for To try and make our program easier to read, we, we use lowercase letters for variables. One thing you've got to, you, you'll, you'll start to get used to as you work with computing, you'll, questions will occur to you as you're exposed to a new language. Languages come in many forms, not just programming languages. For example, behind a web page is HTML, a different sort of language. But often you'll have specifications for particular bits of software. They'll have, to, they'll, have to, they'll have their own little language you talk to. You might do circuit simulation if you're an electrical engineer, and you'll have to specify your circuit in a particular language. So exposed to a language, you'll always, you'll, as you get used to seeing more and more languages, you get used to questions. And one question is, are names case sensitive? Is answer with a capital W different from answer with a small w? And the answer is C is case sensitive. 
another language question is, is there any words I can't use? And in C, some words have a special meaning and you can't use them as variable names. So return, int, and double can't be used as variable names. One nice trick is it's pretty good for important variables to make them up with several words and that you can make your variable name easy to read by putting in an underscore. That was good. Oh, we talked about ints, the range of ints. We looked at the, the under, yeah, so don't panic if you don't understand this. That's that's really a, a comp 1521 topic. It's not that hard to figure out, but that's coming back in comp 1521. Yeah, if you you, you 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 want to get several months ahead, you go and understand double precision floating point format. Uh, that's 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 a that's a big topic for comp one five two one students. They they spend a, a few, we spend a couple of lectures on that, and they spend some lab exercises on that. But if you want to know now, I'm not going to stop you. All right, let's go back to something we do need to do now. So here we are declaring a variable, assigning it a value. And we can even combine them to, we can say, see, I want a variable called answer underscore two, and I'm going to give it, assign to it an initial value. I can assign another value to it later. And this is showing the variable changing through time. At this point, it'll have the value 42. At this point, it'll have the value seven. We have never mentioned what value it has here. Before you give it a value, it, it's undefined. It's not valid to look at the contents of a C variable before you give it a value. Well, that'll come up more than once. And you're saying, wait, wait I don't want that to happen. Well, DCC has special code to, for, for beginner programmers to check. Every time you access a variable, it checks you've given it a value beforehand and will stop your program and tell you if you haven't to help you learn to, to always put values in your variable. All right, printf, printf. Students have to work to understand printf, but after they understand it, it all works well. Yeah, we don't need to recap that. Scanf, we'll do some scanfs today. You you can explore those. Printf and scanf. Oh, now this is what we wanted to see. Yeah, this is the other thing I wanted to highlight from last week. Inside our program, we may have constant values, important values which could be whole numbers, they could be floating point numbers, both of these are floating point numbers, which we're using in maybe just once, maybe 10 times, maybe 100 times through our program. It's often useful to give them names. It can make our program more readable. The benefits are less obvious here. Most people see 3.14159265396539 and realize it's pi. Um, but it's still nice to name it pi. It, it, it will it will it will read better. But you might you might be you might be less likely to pick up that, for example, as the speed of light. When we name constants, we follow a, a rule where we do it all in uppercase. It's important when we're reading through a program that we can instantly separate what's variable, what's a variable, and what's a constant. So if we see a name all in uppercase, we don't have to look at the rest of the program. We know instantly it's a constant. So if you're naming a constant or uppercase, that's just a convention. There are some conventions that 50% of C programmers follow and, and we'll talk about. This is a convention almost 100% of C programmers follow. It's really highly recommended. So anyone, who, 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 not, not just because people have done this course, any, any C programmer will see a, a name all in capitals and think, ah, that must be a constant. All right. Arithmetic is not going to cause you much problem. It's pretty much what you learnt starting in primary school. Brackets around, use brackets as needed. We saw C division. C division is a bit tricky. Why is C division a bit tricky? C, yeah, I guess there's, what, there were two lessons there, wasn't it? C associates a type with a number appearing in your program. If the number, 
has no fractional part, it thinks it's an int. If it has a fractional part, it thinks it's a double. The other thing is, if you do integer division, if you do integer divided by integer, C gives you an integer result. It wouldn't. Have, it's, it's, a, it's a choice. It's a design choice. You're saying, how would I know that? How would I know that beforehand, Andrew? You wouldn't. It's a design choice. Other languages have made other design choices. Sometimes they even change their design choices. Can I make a note on that, though? Um, one of the ways that makes it really easy to think about this is if you think about it in terms of the types. So if you divide an int by an int, clearly you'd expect to get an int. It doesn't really matter what the numbers are. You've got two ints there. It would be really weird if you end up with some other type. Whereas Can I point out divide, there's lots of languages that where you indeed to get a double from, well, or a floating point type from dividing two ints, though? Well, yes. So, so I mean, in other languages, if you're thinking about this in terms of types, that's kind of the intuitive way you might end up with it. So it's probably, like, if you're thinking about this in terms of, in terms of what C does, int divided by an int, of course you're going to get an int. But then once you fill in some real numbers, it might seem a bit weird, but with the types, that kind of makes sense. If you've got a double divided by an int, though, since doubles are a little bit more precise they can represent like more numbers than an int can it kind of intuitively makes sense that you might end up with a double because a double is possibly going to create some things that the int would store so when you're looking at your mathematical operations especially during your labs this week really useful to be thinking about um what type is this thing what type is this thing what type is the result mm -hmm. going to be and then if you sort of you need to apply some brackets so you can say you know 100 divided by three in brackets that's going to be an integer and then if you multiply it by a double, then that result's going to be a double. So you've got to be really careful about what types am I ending up with, and if you're careful about those, then division and these other operations, which can be a bit scary or be a bit weird, might make a bit more sense. One one way I've talked about this, uh, but let me nag you about this, is to write tiny programs. Put five divided by three in a program and see what happens. And if you don't understand what happens, ask in the course forum. So it's writing small programs, running them. So this is a side note. The behavior of this relates to, to what for, to both the computer C was designed for long ago, which was small and slow. Well, small in, in capabilities, not small in physical size. But these days C is very good for, is, it's, one of its main use cases is in tiny chips put inside other devices. And doing a division to produce a double is actually a relatively slow operation compared to other operations. So your washing machine, for example, might prefer to do integer division to work out the length of the wash cycle or something like that um, for, for practical reasons related to the fact it's only got a tiny CPU. So C, um, the, the, its niche, what it gets used for, governs some of the decisions so that people can use C in absolutely tiny CPUs. And you may in future as well. But as Tom said, the why is sort of secondary. Uh, the, the, what it, what C actually does, understanding it. So yeah, int divided by int goes int. But it, if it's either operand is a double, you get a double. You say, oh, do I? Yeah, memorizing this is a bit uh, is hard. Yeah, and and as as you see more of C, and as you see when you if you go on to code in other languages, you, you develop a, uh, it becomes much easier to pick up these things. All right. C also has a percent operator, which more or less complete c computes the modulo. If you know modulo arithmetic, it computes the modulo. It's more accurate probably to say it gives you the remainder, which is a closely related idea, the remainder after division. So 14% 3 gives you the remainder of after what you get dividing 14 by 3, which is 2. We'll, we'll do an example with the modulo operator shortly. Let's keep moving along here. All right, so we saw some examples there. I think I think I've talked enough about all of this. So this is one of these topics that this will be. This is important you understand by the time you graduate, but it's not important for this course. And I'll try and flag all of those. And we saw a few Linux commands which you can practice yourself. All right, let's flick then to ah. All right, so hopefully I'm going to be able to make as I do code up in lectures, the code as I do it should be available live at this URL. You'll have to go down one directory level for today's lecture. Hopefully that will work. We'll see how that works. If statements. All right. The last bit of our recap, if statements. 
they do what's called I'd call control flow and you'd call conditional execution. We want to make a decision and then sometimes execute some statements and sometimes execute not execute those statements. That's an if statement. Can you have an if statement inside an if statement? Yes, you can have whatever you like in here. Between those two braces is whatever C code you want executed conditionally. If this expression is non-zero, whatever's in here could be one line. I'd encourage you to keep it to just a couple of lines, but it could be a hundred lines or a thousand lines and the C compiler won't complain. Your tutor will say your program's unreadable, but the C compiler will not complain if you have a thousand lines inside an if statement. You could have an if statement inside an if statement inside an if statement inside an if statement. It's a bad idea in terms of readability, probably, though we don't have the tools to do anything better at the moment. We will once we see functions. But it's whatever's inside those two braces. They're marking the limits of the code controlled by the if statement. And here's a more complicated if statement. Often we want to do either this code or that code. Never both. Never both. If the expression is zero, this code here is done. Could be one line, could be a thousand. If the expression is non-zero, this code here is done. So this is a fundamental thing there. What's this expression? Often it's something like x greater than zero or, or so on. In fact, yeah, I think we've got some slides coming up. All right, so we did the dice check program. We're going to come back to that and work on that shortly. So we're going to, I'm not going to, I'm going to, here are our comparison operators, the six comparison operators. And when we say, you look, you're learning stuff coding up in C that'll be useful to you in other languages. So if you go on to write R in your stats course, R will have comparison operators more or less like this. The syntax might differ, differ a little. Sometimes that's a different syntax. Sometimes that's a different syntax. Though a lot of languages have copied C. So, which is good news for you learning C because a lot of languages have chosen to use exactly the same characters for the comparison operators. All of these operators can be thought of as as generating zero if the comparison is false and one if the comparison is true. A huge distinction. This one does sort of stuff up students sometimes for weeks. It's one to think about. Equals is a way to put a value in a variable. It changes the variable. It assigns the variable. Other languages sometimes use an arrow or something like that to indicate value going into variable. It doesn't, well, equals equals as a comparison operator is very different. Um, it says, is my left hand side the same equal to my right hand side? Does it have the same value? And it generates a one if, they, if they're the same and a zero otherwise. Ah, so that's our six comparison operators. What more? I'm going to show you a bit more theory and then we're going to and put them together in practice. We also have some logical operators to combine comparisons together. They are, I'd call this AND, OR, and NOT. How would you know that that's AND, OR, and NOT? Yeah, it's an interesting thought. In fact, the, the, the author of Python didn't, doesn't re didn't really like this syntax at all. And while Guido copied most of um, C's um, expression syntax, he changed that to be AND, that to be OR, and that to be NOT. So in Python, you can actually write NOT. Uh, in C, you write an exclamation mark. Which is better? I prefer C, but y y you can have your own opinion on that once you've learned both C and Python don't know Python, that would be something to do, I don't know about between term two and three, maybe just pencil it in for the Christmas break if you don't know Python. Uh, if, you're, if you're in a computing degree, you'll see Python in Comp 1531. All right, so AND is true if both of its operands are true. So I can say something like, well, these are, these are a bit silly, but I could, I could say x is greater than 0 and x is less than 9. In this case, if I say 2 greater than 0 and 2 less than 9, it's the value will be 1. 
if I say two greater than zero and two less than one, the value will be zero. Or is true if either side is, is true. Sorry, or is one if either side is true. So that really should say one, and that really should say one. And not inverts. So if its operand is false, its value is one, it's zero otherwise. So I can say not, and it's best to put brackets there. You get yourself into trouble without brackets. The, there's a question there: Is the not grabbing the 24, or is the greater than grabbing the 24? If in doubt, put brackets there. In that case, I think they're needed. And if you're thinking, if you, there's a question always with bracketing expressions, I'll, I'll mention this again and again. If you're in doubt, just put the brackets in. Don't don't look it up and say, oh, I can get away without the brackets there. There's no cost to using the bracket, and it makes it easier for the person reading the program to understand. And if you get it wrong. Missing brackets have been the cause of disastrous mistakes. So and, or, and not let us combine together and produce complicated expressions which we can use to control if statements. And we'll also see them, they could be used to control loops in the next lecture. Oh, all right. I'm not huge on, 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 on memes and uh, but this this one I thought was brilliant. It's 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 what we see a lot with people who are struggling with their first programs. I've seen it so many times. You get stuck focused on trying looking narrowly, looking really narrowly, trying to solve the problem and you can't get through it. What this cat should be doing is, after spending five minutes trying to solve the problem that way, stopping, looking up, meowing at its tutor to say, help me. And then the tutor would say, have you considered leaping out the side of the box? All right. So even if it's even if you're working at home and don't have the tutor, you could go to the class, course forum, of course. But stop, take a step back, consider your assumptions, consider wider options. It's, it's so often in programming. Don't 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 spend two hours trying to do the problem one way. And on that note as well, it's always a good idea if you're if you're struggling with something. My my sort of suggested three steps: spend a few minutes on it, try it out. Um, if you're in a tutorial, go and either ask your tutor or even just try and figure out what you would ask your tutor, because sometimes that can help. If it's a bigger problem, take a break. Make sure you don't just like keep going on trying to solve this problem because the more that you try and solve the problem, solve the problem, the more your brain is getting fixed into the same way of thinking. Whereas if you sort of go for a walk around the block or you sit down or have a drink of water or something, it really helps you come back and you see the solution faster. And it's always hard to do, but it's really important to do. All right. There's some general problem solving advice. A lot of it involves exploring. This, we set you up in you know to, in a world where you can write C programs, an environment where you can write C programs, where you can fail, you can try something, it fails, and it, it doesn't matter. You can then explore and try something else. Um, and I would say with, well, even with the harder, as lab, we go on with more complicated lab exercises, but definitely with assignments, it's worth writing separate little C programs to try out ideas. So the mark of a student succeeds in this course is one that says, oh, the AND operator. I, I'll, I'll try and write a little program with the AND operator. All right, so we're working back to the dice checker program. A student, in the, when, we, when we wrote it last Thursday, had a, you know, I saw at least one student in the chat asking, yeah, what if the user enters the wrong value? Can we do something about that? So that's what we're going to explore in, in, in the remainder of this this hour. So this was the input that the student was worrying about. This was this is they entered their number, and what have we cut coming in there? Well, we know that's a, it's an int coming in. That's that's I'm, I've said. You've just got to assume basically at this stage that this gets an int in. We've talked a bit about what it means. The ampersand will explain. Yeah, no, well, not even completely in this course. 
conceptually in this course and you'll see uh, the, the, the nitty gritty of how it gets implemented in Comp 1521. But that's it. That gives scanf a way to change this variable and it changes it to contain whatever number it manages to read from the terminal. But that could be anything from negative 2 billion to positive 2 billion. Whereas we want a six-sided dies, so we want a number between one and six. We, we really have a, there's a gap between what we could get and what we want. All right, so let's, 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 let's actually code this rather than look at slides. Um, let me switch. Here I am on VLAB. Bear with me for a second. So I'll pop up a terminal. I'm not going to. Uh, I changed my prompt to what I thought students had, and then discovered. Ooh, then discovered I was wrong. Sorry, you have to forgive me. OBS has a wonderful program which I use for streaming, but it makes my prompt confusing. All right. So I'm going to change yeah to a completely different directory in the class account, which is where. which will be accessible by that URL. I'm going to write my program there. Ooh, we have to go further. We have to go to live. That was a, oh, and up here, yeah, yes, I've, I got the screen thing going. So you, when I type a tab key now, uh, well, that's not very clear, but that's it's showing you that I'm typing a tab key. So if you look at the top of the screen, you can see what keys I'm typing. Um, because that, well, whether that's helpful or not, we'll go there. And we're going to copy in the program we wrote yes, uh, last, in, which was Dice Checker. And we'll call it okay. Now we've said first CP there. We, we will introduce a few Linux programs. They're, they're not, we, we only introduce them because you need them. It's not something we're necessarily trying to treat, teach you in this course. There are later courses that really get into lots of Linux programs, but there are some you need to get by. I think it's about five of them really you need to survive in the course. CD being one of them. MookDeer to create a directory. CP, um, it makes a copy of a file. I said we we'll do this a lot in programming. You'll you'll be faced with a lab exercise that says do y, and you think, oh well, last week's lab exercise is do x, and x is not that different to y. So you'll copy x dot c to y dot c, and start with y dot c, and you might have some you might have a running start. Sometimes we'll give you code as well to give you a running start at an exercise because we don't want to waste too much time on these things. All right. Um, so I've copied that across. I can see that with the LS, by the way. It'll show me, yeah, I've got, that's another one of our survival programs. LS, show me the files in the current directory by default. I've used a weird name here to go across directory trees. Well, you can research that if you want. But uh, So we're doing a bit more complicated things than the student has to do because I've gone to the class account to put this file so it'll be accessible. So I just want to make sure it's got, oh, it doesn't have read permissions on it. All right, so I've got to do something. That makes it accessible to the web server. Again, that's much more a thing for later courses. If we, if we, if we ever need you to do a command like chmod, change mode, change permissions, we just give it to you. So you might see that in the instructions for an assignment. You might see a command like this, say, do this. Will you just do that? All right. Oh, wait. Sorry. I should be using Gedit. I was just dropping into VI, which is the VI is the editor which I use when I'm connecting remotely to a server like this by choice. But Gedit's much better for you. Okay. All right. Up pops Gedit. Let's try. It. Ooh, that's a little scary. That looks nice. All right. So here's our dice 
just doesn't want to resize for me nicely. All right, that'll do anyway. Here's our dice check program. So this bit here is what we'll see on all of our programs. A program should start out with advice. Now it's not advice to the compiler. What does a slash slash say? That says to the compiler, just forget what's on the rest of the line. Compiler sees two slashes and that says, ah, forget it. This is for humans. So we start out with some help for humans. Classical things would be what this program does. Then in a larger program or a more important program, there might be a guide into the program to help you figure it out. You've got to maintain this program. Go to this part if you want to fix this. Go to this part if you want to configure that. There might be a guide in, like the um, chapter guide at the start of a book, for example. More important information here, who wrote this program, um, when they wrote it, why they wrote it. Licensing would be another. Do, who has permission to copy or use this program would be another classic thing to put there. An email address would often be a great thing to have here, so anyone who wants can contact the author. So that's nice. Um, just bear with me, I'm going to switch my head across to the left hand part of the screen so I'm not I'm not covering any code. I think that's probably better. All right, uh, okay. So we scroll down. Oh, we've seen all of this. We've got two int variables in this program. We read one in, but then we just assume it's within the range, 1 to 6. So how would we check? All right, so let's put some checks in here and check. Actually, I guess what I should do is also compile the program and run it. So I'm over here. Compile the program. Let's make sure it works and see the problem. I run it. So I enter three, enter four. School roll was succeeded. But what happened if I entered minus four and a thousand? Ten. We're not checking. Well, I'm a bit worried about my program now. program seems to have a bug. Let's go down and look at our, the rest of the program and see why it did that. Oh, there's a greater than equal there. That really should be a double equal, shouldn't it? If pro equals equals secret target. There we go. Fixed a bug. Let's check our bug fix. You can see there I typed control C and DCC told me helpful. Well, I didn't. Not helpful there at all where my program was up to. Oh, and I've written half an if statement now. All right, I'll go to writing the whole if statement. Oh, we saw this trick. I'm halfway through writing a bit of code, but want to compile my program and run the existing code. So I just say, oh, that's a comment. And the compiler will ignore it. So we can now check to see if my fix of the program works. We enter four and five. My school roll failed. I think it, but I can enter a hundred thousand and eight. So there's no checking there. Uh, so, oh, secret target. Yeah, it's nice having this up here because if we want to change it, it's in. It's an easy to find place. We don't have to search through the code and find out where the target is. This is a crucial part of this program. What is the secret target? And this makes it easier to change and easier to find. It's, it's, it's fantastic, not for making the program run faster, not for making the program c compile correctly. It's fantastic for 
a human be able to change, read, understand the program. And we're talking about it over and over again. We write C code, sure, that's got to be do whatever the task is correctly. But we also write C code that's easy, that's easier for a human to understand, ensure is correct, work with. All right, so if the variable is die one, so if die one is less than one, what do we do? Yeah, good question. And this, the other possibility is if die one greater than six, what do we do there? Probably the same thing. Oh. Sorry, you'll have to use me. I'm so clumsy with this editor. A week or two, and you'll be much more proficient than me with it. All right, there we go. Hmm. Well, one possibility is we can just terminate the program. We can just stop. Sometimes that's what we want. There's no point going any further. And this is something we'll see much more of. Main is a function. It's the only function we're going to see for a little while. And we're not going to talk much about what functions do. But here's a word. We've already seen it. But return says stop the function execution. The one there says something went wrong. That's, a, that's really a side note. But if I want to get out of main saying no, things aren't good, I can do that. So let's try that out as code. If the if the if the if the if the, if the first die is an inappropriate value, we'll just stop our program. Let me save that using the control S shortcut. Flip over here. Let me just resize that. That's annoying me. So we recompile our program. We've got a new version of the code ready to run. And it hopefully, if I enter a thousand, well, I ended a hundred, the program just terminates silently. Mm, all right. Could be better sort of safe but it's it's very unfriendly to a user isn't it so if it's going to have a human using our program just excellently silently doesn't seem very satisfactory there are other circumstances where it might be fine um, if this was a program that wasn't really used by end users maybe that would be okay uh, I don't think so normally you want some sort of message, an error message, I'd say, to say what's gone wrong. So I guess, yeah, what message would we use? All right. Let's try. Let's go with that. And we put it there. Yeah, all right. It's not the best message, but it's something. Let's try that out. Now, I think both Tom and I mentioned that this this week. Uh, students often have, they sort of think about a program. That's great. They think, you know, maybe on the bus or something like this. They think about a program, and then they type it all in, and then they spend ages trying to figure out bits here and bits there. It's better if you can certainly compile incrementally. 
write five lines, compile them, make sure they're correct. Write another five lines, compile them, make sure they're correct. Now you have to do some parts of a program. You can't always compile you call, uh, um, random parts of your program. So it has to be a valid program. But often, as you progressively add lines to your program, it, at certain stages, it should be a valid program, and you can try compiling it. Even better is if you can run and test your program in parts as well. And that's a bit harder to, to, to achieve, but it's, it's so, so useful. So this isn't a great program, but we can run it. We can check, test it. So let's, let's enter a, a dice roll. While you're, you're talking, Andrew, there are some good questions in the chat about return one versus return zero. The important thing with that is just the return part, which just means that end, end main, which means like no, no more code will get executed. One and zero is just convention. One generally means like an error, something went wrong. Zero means everything was okay. And pretty much always when you're writing code, you're gonna be dealing with return zeros. Um, but if, if something's gone wrong, like there's an error, return one just means this thing was an error. Um. It becomes really important when we have programs which run other programs, which we almost never do in this course, which we do a lot of, for example, in later courses, Comp2041 is all about programs running other programs. Um, a little bit in comp one five two one. So it, for now, it's it's the return is the big thing. Saying I want to get out of main. What value mains returning is is is, is not really important to us. Uh, and as Tom said, it's a convention. It's an almost universal convention. It's, there is a there is a machine out, a platform out there that doesn't follow it. All right, there's my program working with an error message of sorts. I get a minus four, it says not a valid die value. All right, I want to make this better, but it's, it's a bit annoying, isn't it? I've got this repeated code here and here. Programmers hate repeated code. It's extra work, it makes things harder to read, and it creates the possibility of errors if someone changes one bit of code and not the other. It's just repeated code we hate. Can we, can we combine these? And the answer is we can using an AND statement. Both those IF statements do the same thing. Oh, sorry, OR. I can, so I can change to an OR. And suddenly, my program is simpler. So I can say if die1 is less than 1 or die1 is greater than 6, do this. Now, it's niggling me here. There's another thing you'll, you'll hear from this tutor. You'll hear from anyone who's done quite a bit of coding. Another thing we hate, along with repeated code, is seeing sort of numbers in the text, and we're not quite sure what the numbers are. And often the phrase, the old phrase for a mystical caller, it's a magic number. It appears there, but it's a bit hard to tell why it's there, what it means. And you're saying, well, it's obvious, Andrew. It's the number of sides on a dice. That's not exactly true, is it? We, I think we saw in the lecture slides, um, it, it's possible for there to be more than six sides on a dice. Did we have a picture? Oh, look there. We have a lovely yes. four-sided die, eight, 16. I'm not sure what that one is there. So we, we would There's, like to vary. There should be a 20-sided die, maybe. It could be a 20-sided die. But we really want to replace that 1 and that 6 with constants. What do we call it? Max die, min die. And up here, put the Notice all caps. I'm just giving a name to those values. The first thing, the very first thing the C compiler does, we'll see it'll see min die and it'll put one there. It'll see max die, it'll put six there. It's important to remember that by the way, it's done as an I'd call it a pre-processing stage, is replace all constants by their value. 
So it's important to think what would it, when you're writing out what will happen to my code if that turns into one and that turns into six. Yeah, that's what I want. That's great. All right. Now, let's try and be user friendly. I must admit, I'm not the best programmer in the world at writing user friendly code, but let's 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 try and improve on some of my mistakes of the past. What does the user want to know? We've told it that wasn't a bad a bad it was a bad value. One good thing to do would be to tell them actually. Oh, come on, get it? Why are you so bad? Is to say what wasn't a bad value. Make it obvious. So we'd say is to include that. All right, let's compile all of that and make sure that bit works before we go on to make it more complicated. Try new things. We're about to take a break, by the way. And Tom, before we take a break, you can give me any questions that I should cover from the chat. All right. Enter my first dice roll. If I enter nine, nine another dice value. Let's try a negative number. Actually, let's try zero. Ah, good. The other thing would to be user friendly would be to say what the valid dice values are. So it must be between min die and max die. <sighs> All right. There. Yeah. I may have written user unfriendly code in the past, but this is good. Into your first dice roll. So let's wait. Oh, all right. So we discovered something really important here. And that's, I mean, I, I yeah, I did know that beforehand, but I wanted to show you how easily you can discover things by writing little programs yourself. Useful, important things. So if I put min die or max die, if I put a constant in a string between double quotes, it doesn't get replaced by its value. It's really the one place C doesn't do that. Because it, C is worried that this, this name might appear accidentally between double quotes. It, it could do that, but it doesn't. It's a sensible decision by C's inventor. And most languages, well, languages do different things here. How do I fix that? And here you have to think a bit. We do have a way of adding a value in, interpolating a value, putting it here, saying to printf, include an int value here. So at this spot, I want you to fill it in with an int. Which int? The one that's following you as a uh, comma separated. So if I, if I, I can put min die and max die there, and the C compiler will replace them by their value. They're not inside the double quotes. So that's that's my solution. I'll say to printf, put, the, put an int value here and put an int value here, and then afterwards I'll put min die and max die, and they will get put in there just like variables. So the same way we, we got to put a variable into the printf. We've got min die and max die and put them in. <sighs> All right. I'm going to control it, com compile that, run that. And if that works, I'm going to answer any questions that Tom passes on from the chat. And then we're going to have a five minute break and I'm going to stretch and stand up and Go out and look at the beautiful sunny day. Not it's it's a it's good coding weather at the moment. It's miserable outside. All right, so let's try it. We put in a thousand. I'm gonna put in minus forty-five. All right, so there we have complete code to one approach to this problem. I'd call it input valid invalid validation or handling of invalid input it's it gets neglected in our in, in course in programs you're going to write in uh, as we go through this because we're trying to t do so many things we don't have the time to add the extra code to do a lot of error checking 
particularly exams and test questions, I always say error checking not necessary because we want you to spend the time you've got on the other parts of the program. But if we're writing real programs, it, it's crucial. It's really, really important. You need to spend a lot of time on it. Um, so yeah, don't think because you, you see examples we do to try and fit things on our lecture slide, examples we do to give you time to do an exam question that, that, that we say don't bother with this, that that's not important. It's, it's really important. Huh. We can come back and look at a different approach to this, but Tom, questions? I think we're mostly okay on questions. I think the one thing that there was a little bit of confusion about was um, the scanf versus printf. Why was there an ampersand in front of die one when there wasn't in front of? Uh, uh, sorry, on line twenty four there was, on line twenty seven there wasn't. I think it's been answered, but probably good to just mention quickly. All right. There's one answer is it's it's magic, uh, and it's hard to go a lot beyond that with what we know now. Um, and there are programming languages where you wouldn't need the ampersand. They could have designed C, so you wouldn't need the ampersand. But the reason is um, printf just needs to know what the value of the variable is. Printf doesn't need to change the variable. All it wants to do is get the value of the variable and print it out, put it on the terminal. Scanf's job is to change that variable. So it's got to have some way to get at the variable and change it. The ampersand gives scanf the opportunity to change the variable. And we'll see So it's worth noting as a summary then. Oh, sorry. No, you go on. I was just going to say it's worth noting as a summary that every time you use scanf, pretty much you'll need to use an ampersand in front of your variables. Every time you use printf, pretty much you'll never need to use an ampersand. So if you just remember scanf has ampersand, printf doesn't have ampersand, that rule is going to serve you pretty well for the first at least six weeks of the course and be pretty fine. And the, the DCC, the C compiler we've got, tries to, to, to give you good messages for those mistakes. You might find C compilers out there, there certainly used to be every C compiler, would give you horrible messages that are really hard to understand if you, say, forgot an ampersand. DCC will try to tell you, oh, I think you've forgotten, forgotten your ampersand on the scanf, or maybe you don't need that ampersand on the printf. All right, five minute break. I'm going to get up, stretch, refocus. You should too, good eye hygiene. Um, Maybe eat a piece of fruit, healthy body, healthy brain. But anyway, we're back in five minutes.
All right, everyone. I hope you got up stretched. Um, well, I hope you're somewhere with a bit better weather than Sydney. Particularly good coding day, I guess. Inside warm and writing code. Uh, all right, so that's where we finished up with the dice checking program. Uh, another possibility occurs to me. This says, look, I'm just going to stop. Often that's the right choice. So we've added information to help out the user, but we're just stopping. Now, one possibility would be to say, go back, say, enter your number again. Next Thursday's lecture will cover repeating operations, looping. But we, we can't do that yet. So what about making the value right? So let's look at two approaches for making the value right. Convert this to a valid value. Instead of printing out a message, instead of exiting, make it a valid value. Well, I can do that. Here's one possibility. Oh, do I know that die with threes between min die and max die? I actually don't. Um, so I, I could assign something to die one that makes it valid. And I guess the logical thing is, if it's less than the minimum, I'll make it the minimum. This program it's not right some of you are saying oh is that right Andrew no it's not but let's it's often useful to get code that's not quite doing what we're wrong and make sure we understand the meaning of the code so what does that do what does that program do I mean, it's a bit hard to tell isn't it because well, I'll run the pro I'll compile it and run it. It does. It's a valid program, I believe. Oh, no, it's not a valid program. Why? What's DCC telling me? Line twenty-eight expected expression. Line fifty-three expected <laughs> brace to match this brace. Uh, so sometimes you've got to think a bit about error messages. Sometimes you just can't figure out what the error messages mean. You just got to try and look in the right place and see what you can wrong. DCC is coming to the party here trying to give you some extra help. It says make sure all opening brace symbols are matched with a closing brace. Every brace has to have its matching friend. This one has got its friend here. This one has no friends. That's sad. Well, not only sad, it makes it invalid C program. And I needed a brace there. Huh, that's a valid C program. It doesn't do really what we'd like. But I can't check it out because I have to enter two values and I see what this, well, I don't even see what they are. Wait. Well, I can, yeah, I can sort of, I can infer what they are, can't I? Ah, what happened there? Four plus four. That's not ten. Mm. Let's try again. Two and four. Also not ten. One and four. All right, you can probably figure it out from there, but let me show you what you probably should do if you're trying to debug this program. You'd probably do something like this. You'd say, 
tell me what die one is now. Yeah, this is what a tutor might say. You're saying you're a tutor. Uh, this doesn't work, and she might say, uh, "Well, why don't you add a printf at line 30 and see what it says is in die one?" That would be a helpful tutor. So I'm going to say, for now, don't run lines 30 to 3 on in my program. Let's just find out what my if statement has done to die one. Don't be that student that says, well, I know what it does. Your tutor's telling you this for a reason. And sometimes we're confused. Sometimes even there's, a, there's an error in the program we can't even see. We've got the, the program in our brain is correct. The program in G edit, no. There's a subtle error, an, an extra character, a missing character. That's a valid C program, but a different valid C program. So let's run this out. So enter 5. Oh. Enter 78. And you can see what it's doing. I've got the wrong if statement. Well, wrong. It's not what I wanted. If the die value was too big, I wanted to make it max die. If it's too small, I want to make it min die. So it's minus 9. Yeah, it becomes min die. How do I fix that? Another if statement. I can do that. This is what I wanted. It's not quite the best way to write this. That's not the only way to write it. There's, there's always more and more ways to write it. Then it becomes which looks best, which is easiest to understand, which can be I most easily assure myself that is correct. Which is fastest to write if I'm under time pressure? It's worth noting as well, um, Andrew, just for a moment there, made a very small mistake, which he instinctively corrected. But it's one thing that's worth thinking about. Um, before, we had no space between the, 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 the angle bracket and the M in max die. And he just went back and fixed it. But you might be wondering, you know, should I have spaces there? Or should I not have spaces there? And why are there spaces in certain places or set places in not? be really useful to just have a look at how your tutors and Andrew are writing their code, putting spaces in certain places and not having them in not. Um, we can talk about what the specific rules are if you get confused, but try and match this kind of style because um, this is the style that pretty much everyone in the course will be using, and it is the style that we think makes it easiest to read and understand your programs. So I can write the program like that, and the C compiler will say, yeah, that's all good. But the human looking at it goes, I can't understand to see that. It visually makes no sense. It's hard to read. So, Tom, we, we, we follow conventions to try and make it easy to, to as quickly and as easily as possible for a human to understand what the code does. And those humans include us. And excellent advice. Just follow what you see in the example code in the course, your tutor writes. Once you're out of this course, you can adopt your own style conventions. You can convince the world C programmers that yours is a better style, and, 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 and that's fine. But for now, walk before you run. Just just follow our style. All right, I think, I think that compiles. I've been wrong before, and I think it's good now. I think that will clamp the value. Yeah, that's a nice word for it. That's clamping the input in the range. Uh, so we enter a value that's too small, it gets set to min. We enter a value that's too big, it gets set to max. Should we produce a warning message to the user? Yeah, that's that really depends on our circumstances. But probably for this program, yes. Other circumstances, no. And this is this is such a common piece of code. I'd call it such a common programming pattern. We have an input coming into a function, to a program, into a something. And the first thing we do is limit it in, into a certain range so that we can now depend on it being in that range and up and following code and avoid any sort of problems. All right.
So yeah, clamping is one word for this, clamping it to that range. But if the if the dice is less than one, it will make it one. If it's greater than six, we'll make it six. Does this change the program? I don't think it does. Something to think about. Other ways to write this program. I can see two other ways to write what's the same program. I think I'll show you what I think is the best. I think this is probably the best way to write it. You can chain if statements together like this, and it's not a, it's 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 something you're used to seeing, and it's quite readable. So that's one way to write a series of if statements saying if x is true, do this. If y is true, do this. If z is true, do this. And you can even put an else on the end saying if none of them went true, do that. A chain of if statements. So I think that's the nicest way to write this. Does the same thing. And you could actually get rid of the else and write them as two separate if statements. And in this case, not every case, in this case it would do the same thing because if die one's greater than max die, the, the first if statement has to be false. But I think that's the best way to write this. Ah, all right. So that's clamping the value into the range just by checking maximums and minimums. Let me show you another way to do this, which is, I think, wait, let's, let's see if I've got a slide on modulus. Yes. All right. Percent gives us the remainder of a division. So if I take percent 6, I get a number 0 to 5. There's a lot in computing that depends on, on, on modular arithmetic. It pops up all sorts of places. So if we want a number 1 to 6, we could sort of take it percent 6 and maybe add one to it or do something. So percent or modulo also gets used a lot to limit a number into a particular range. One thing you might see is um, if you want if you wanted to queue up students in ten separate queues, you might take their ZID percent ten, that will give you a number zero to nine. And then you could say go to if you use that number to say which Q you go to. You take your ZID percent ten, and if it's a three, you go to Q three. ZID percent ten, if it's zero, you go to Q zero. We actually do that. To the, we had a lot of auto tests queued up um, in to go to the, the the student page, and one of our admins said, "Oh, I'll do that." You're saying it's just the last digit. Yeah, T taking something percent ten gives you the last digit for a positive number. Right, so let's apply modulus in my program. This is just a taste of thing. It's a fun operator. You can do all sorts of cute things with it, and it doesn't. It's it's not something you're really going to struggle with. You'll figure it out, and then it'll stay figured out. Oh, I think there's actually, one or two questions in, in the chat that just indicate it might be good to, to to step through that just one more time, really briefly, if that's all right, Andrew. Um, the the way that that I would often explain it is, you know, when you're back in primary school and you're talking about five divided by three we'd say that there's one with remainder two and so all the modulus operator does modulus means or, or something modulo something else just means get me that remainder so you would have five divided by three gives you one but five modulo three or five get the remainder when divided by three gives you two um so yes it is like modulus in math for those who are asking that yeah, so some people are saying, is modulo the same as modulus? And I'm not sure why there's two different words, but they mean pretty much the same thing. In in school, it sometimes gets, in high school, or it sometimes gets called clock arithmetic. Um, and it, it's used, it pops, yes, I said, it pops up in all sorts of contexts. But as Tom says, yeah, if I take, if I take 24% 5, it's the same as dividing 24 by 5, which is... Four remainder four wasn't a good example. Uh, Twenty-three percent five will be three. It's 
because 23 divided by 5 is 4 with 3 remainder. Try it out, right? So with super... integers... Oh. Keep going. Mm, sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, with, with integers, you can kind of think of, of division and modulo as sort of the, the twin operators that kind of work together well, because you can use division to get the, the first number, and then you can get modulo to get the sort of remainder blah. And together, that sort of almost gives you the same thing as if you were dividing two double numbers or two, two like decimal numbers. Um, but yes, I agree with Andrew. Definitely practice this. Just play around with it. It's a really good way to like understand it better. If you're kind of confused, try it out in a few circumstances. All right. So here is my cunning plan: is if the dine is out of range, so if it's too small or too big, I'm going to use modulo. I'm going to say die one equals die one. Percent max die. So that's going to, if max die is six, that'll give me a number zero, one, two, three, four, or five. All right. So I need a plan here to cope with it being zero. And I'm, if it's zero, I'll make it, if the modulo is zero, I'll just flip it to the other end. Is that a good decision? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? <sighs> All right, let's try that out. I'm hoping when it comes out of when we get to line thirty-two, well, this value must be valid. It must be between min die and max die inclusive must be 1 to 6 in this case but if I change 1 and 6 up there this will always I'll always have a valid die value when I get here let's try this out valid program but there's an infinite number of valid C programs and a small, small, tiny subset that do what we want to solve the problem. So just the compiler working, yeah, that's great. It makes us feel better. But does the code, when executed, do what we want? All right, here's testing. Let's try a, val a value that's in the range. 4 should stay 4, and it does. Because we, this if statement says here, if die 1 less than min die, well, that's 0. Die 1 greater than max die, well, that's 0. 0 or 0 is 0, so the if statement is not executed. So we just go straight to line 32, and die 1 stays as 4. Well, that's good. All right, let's try 23. All right, let, let me try and work this out. 23% 6. 23 divided by 6 is 3, remainder 5. 3 times 6 is 18. 18 plus 5 is 23, so the remainder is 5. So 23% 6 is 5. So if I've done my year 7 maths right, oh, look at that. It's into the range. Look at that. All right, a good test would be something where that percent 6 is 0. So 30. Oh, let's run the program. So 30% 6 is 0. 30 is divisible by 6, so 30% 6 is... Oh, it's a way to test for divisibility. We could we could, we could, could check for primality and things like this. Don't worry, we, we will. I love prime numbers. I hope you love prime numbers. I love prime numbers. And we'll get to that, I'm sure. But with loops. So 30% 6 will be 0, and then line 28 should trigger, and this should be set to max die. So it should come out as 6, not 0. Ah, my program is brilliant, super brilliant. I am a genius. All right, does anyone have any tests I should try? Input tests. What input tests should I try? Oh, I can see in the chat, Finn. Hi, Finn, is saying, what about negative all right um, 
good question, Finn. Let's let's try it out. Let's put in negative nine. Oh, well, full marks to <laughs> Justin. You're a bit late to the party, but minus thir I'll, I'll do minus thirteen for Justin. We've got a lot of people coming in. Yes, all right. Oh, negative numbers are a problem, aren't they? Actually, not all negative numbers are a problem. I think negative 18 will be fine. Yes. All right. So we've discovered that a property of percent that we didn't know about. If you're mathematically inclined, you'll discover that uh, percent's not quite modulo. I take, is it? Yeah. Um, at least as you'd expect from doing it in maths. And that it's, a, it's an excellent example of things we should try to test. I want to know if my code works. I've got to think of what might be problematic for it. There are actually people who, who this is this is their job, is they just test other people's programs. I don't think I'd like to do that job, but it's an important job, certainly. That's a very important job. Um, but yes, you can imagine, for example, I've had students come out of this course, well, the predecessor's courses, really, and go on to write code for medical implants. And you're thinking, uh, We'd want to be really, really sure before we cut someone open and put a device containing code inside them because it's not going to be good if we have to do surgery again to go in and fix the bug. So they're testing. You'd want to be able to lot you'd want to test every way you can. All right, so this is in, in tiny scale in microcosm was it. The suggestion from the chat was, you know, try a negative number. Even if we, yeah, it's a natural thing to try, even if we weren't aware that percent did not quite what we expected with negative numbers. I'll leave as an exercise for you to figure out exactly what percent does, but it relates to remainders and a certain property of remainders. And you can still make 2% do whatever you want. If you want a positive number, you can easily turn, turn that into a positive number. What I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to cheat. I'm going to go this. If we get a number that's less than min die, I'm going to make it max die. There we go. Now, now, that guarantees this will be correct at this point. Is that good code? Yeah, that's, that's, that's not entirely clear. But if I enter minus 89, it'll come out as max die. If I enter minus 5, it'll come out. All right. Yeah, you're seeing there's, 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 there's sort of a weird thing here is any, any negative number becomes max die. Is that good? Maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe it does. Then we've got to think about what we can do. There are other things we could do here, and you can, you can, you can explore them yourself. We have code here. We're using modulo in a cute way, and we'll certainly see modulo again, percent again, to to get to to force an invalid variable into our range. It's not, there's a design decision as well. We're doing this silently, so we're turning silently turning minus five into six. Is that good design? It very much de depends on our situation. One thing I would one. One word of advice I would say, you might say, oh, look, my work here is done. I will just delete lines 32 and 33. In general, it, I would say, until you have, have a, sure your whole program is correct, comment out these extra statements we add for debugging. I'd call that line 32 a debugging printf. It's pretty common to think, ah, my program works, my program works, delete the line, and then five minutes later discover, oh, wait, wait, it's not doing what I expect. I need to put that, I need that information again. I want that statement back. So for the sort of programming we do, I just comment it out. Now, if this is something you want to make beautiful, it's an assignment, you put a lot of work in it, you want to make it really beautiful at the end, At the right at the end, you might delete the code that you put in there only to help you debug your program, this extra code to get information about variables to get your program working. So the final version, you might remove them. But until you get to that final version, I keep them in. More sophisticated Can programs. 
might have debugging code you turn on and off, perhaps controlled by a variable or in other ways, um, which we, we probably won't get to in this course. Tom. Yep. Uh, two quick things. First of all, uh, there was a moment there, and I'm sorry for picking you up on the small things, but somehow your cursor turned into a black box, and instead of deleting code or in inserting things, it sort of replaced characters. Oh, Can you explain oh, yes, what that it was? Did. All right, so that sometimes that happens. So that that I, I don't understand why that happened at that particular point, honestly. Um, but it is possible in terminals and editors to have two sorts of modes. One is insert mode, where characters you type get inserted, and the other is delete mode. I wonder if I type D. Does, no, um, does that switch me it to insert, delete? Insert the insert key. Does it again? Ah, there you're right. So it toggles with the insert key in G edit apparently. And now if I type something, it will overwrite it. So I hit. I can go from insert where the cursor is a line and and characters are added. Toggle it with insert. There you go. I never use overwrite mode because I I would actually just wipe them with the mouse and then type. The reason I bring this up is because often we have it in in labs. Students will get this black cursor. So if you ever see this black cursor, the solution is just press press the insert key on your keyboard, and it'll all get fixed. But it's just a good thing to note because sometimes that really messes with people, and we get questions about why is my code not working? Why is my why is my insert in cursor not working? That's a useful thing to note. Um, the other thing which I was going to note as well is that sometimes what happens uh, when you've got a lot of debugging code, especially in bigger things like an assignment, is that you'll add things like printf ah uh, or printf I think I'm here maybe or printf and then some words I probably can't say in a lecture. You know, I this is really annoying. Something something something. Right. So if you've got a lot of code like that, one thing that can actually be helpful at that point is to try and clean up your debugging. So even though you probably shouldn't submit your debugging code at the end, even during your programming, make sure that you're cleaning up and only living in the things that are really um, helping you. Because otherwise, you're going to have a lot of noise. And that one printf that's really telling you what's going on will be lost among the 50 billion printfs that are doing something else. So printfs are useful, but just be careful about how many you're using and try and make sure that they're actually helping you rather than just sort of spamming you. So that's a really classic sort of debugging statement. I'm trying to debug an if statement or some or a while loop. I'll add in a printf like that to say, oh, I'm executing. I'm about to execute line 30, which is completely unneeded. And Tom's talking about yeah, you can when you 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 can get rid of those earlier on. Now there's a few questions in the chat talking about the mathematical properties of this, and and they're absolutely right. How this maps number the the range of the integers into the range one to six has properties that might not be ideal. It depends on the purposes. If we're just getting occasionally getting um, invalid inputs and it doesn't really matter much what we do with them as long as they become valid, this code is fine. If we want this to systematically uniformly have to have certain mathematical properties, no, this doesn't have certain mathematical properties. It maps a lot of negative integers to max die. So max die, if we're getting a lot of negative integers, then max die is occurring a lot more often. Uh, and you, you would do something more clever here. And I'm leaving that as an exercise for you. Uh, all right. I want to go back to my lecture slides for a little while and see what we've got there. Yeah. So yeah, there's no single answer here as to what's right. It it depends on our purposes, and in different. Con I'm showing you. I've showed you deliberately showing you a couple of different sorts of code, a couple of different. I'd call them programming patterns, because in different circumstances, they'll be what you, one one each one of them will be what you want. The important thing is to learn each of the patterns so you can apply them. And they get applied in multiple contexts, so they're important things to see. All right, so there's a whole, that, sorry, that's just talking you through the dice checkers.
All right, there's a few small programs here. I won't code these up and run them, but they're all on the class website. So there's a link in the lecture slides for you to click on, which will take you to the class website. There's other ways to get at them. So you can get these programs, compile them, and run them. What does divide by zero do? Interesting question. I believe divide by zero. Well, all right. I believe we're not mathematicians here. We can we can execute this. Um, let's. I said I wasn't going to do this, but I am. Let's grab our program to date and make it into divide. Let's see. And I, I'll just make sure divide.c is readable to the web server, so you can access it if you want. What of this code do I need? Well, almost nothing really. It's a bit sad, isn't it? Like throwing it away all. They don't even, even a variable. Is this program's becoming tiny? I'll see if the compiler lets me do that. Let's work out six, not percent zero. Percent zero would be interesting as well, but divided by zero. The only problem with this, the compiler might stop me straight away, saying, "Andrew, that's a bad idea." Oh. DCC is saying it. Uh, all right. How do I? I need to. That might be enough to disguise my attempt to divide by zero, so I can. I can actually run the code. Yes, I can. Actually, I'm surprised the DCC didn't pick that up. So easy to fool a computer. They're so silly. Oh, and I've overwritten my dice checker. Damn it. The... All right, um, which is really annoying. Uh, I'm going to go back, save this file. The dice checker is back. Sorry. I'm... We know where we're going. This won't take long. Yeah, I highly recommend making copies of your programs as you move on. Um, also, if you're doing a lot of work on something, get it copied to multiple places. If you've got an internet connection, your CSC account, or copy to a USB stick or just another directory. All right, so what I was doing was in x equals zero and then dividing by x. It is worth noting that every time you auto test or you use give to submit, your code is saved. And that's really, really useful because it means that we, uh, if you lose your code or if your computer dies or if your dog eats your bites or something, I don't know, um, we, can restore, we can restore that. So um, really, really good practice to submit regularly to um, auto test regularly. You can give an auto test as many times as you like. So please, please, please just regularly, every time you finish working on something, auto test it, just so that we can access it if you've lost your files, basically. Oh, and I'm compiling, oh, I'm not having a good day here. Let me, You might notice I use tab completion to finish off file names. You can try that out yourself. You type the tab key if you've tried part of a file name. And if it's unambiguous, that will, the, the terminal, the shell, will complete the rest of the file name for you. All right, I've compiled my divide program back where we were and run it. Uh, and. DCC stops execution. What will happen in other C compilers? Yeah, it's really undefined. A C compiler could do anything, absolutely anything here. Uh, 
So it's important not to divide by zero. Hmm. All right. Notice DCC telling me here in a not a very legible color um, that where my, the problem is in my code. If look down here, it's saying it also gives me the values of some variables. It's saying that when code execution stop, I think you might want to know x, x was zero. Here's where execution stop. What was the actual error? And then DCC's throwing in a bit of information for you. Read that carefully and you're happy. All right, so let's go back to my lecture notes. I had a scheme to avoid that using if. And there we have uh, saying if y is not equal to 0, yeah, go ahead with the division. Otherwise, print out a message saying that. So there's a nice little bit of code. whole program is there, which you can try out. Yeah, all right. What else have we got in the way of programs? Ah, I like this one. This one's quite nice. This is sort of in the theme of the of the of the code we saw before. It's another example. I, I like I like examples. Yes. Yeah, so we won't be able to get a chance to go through all the examples um, in any detail, like we went through the dice checker one. But that doesn't stop you going through, and you can grab this code and you can experiment, and try it. This one is so much. It fits very much in the theme of the valid input. But rather than valid input, we want absolute value. So if x we want to convert x from negative to positive. So if x is this is this is a not a math this is yeah a mathematician wouldn't write this like this. This is a programmer's way of doing it. Um, we we assign x into absolute value, and that's great if x is zero or positive because it's the absolute value of a non-negative number is itself, so we can do that assignment. But absolute value, this variable has an incorrect value while, until we execute the next if statement. So we come down here and say if x is less than zero, then flip. Would that be better written with an else? Yeah, maybe. But it, it's been written like that to show you a different way of writing the C, so you make sure you understand the meaning of writing that C. So, Ah. Of course, negative one times a negative number gives you a positive number. All right, what else have we got? Oh, relativistic mass. You can check. You can play with that program you, if you're particularly you're physically inclined. Check whether you're you, you work out the relativistic mass of something depending on its speed. You can compute Einstein's equation there rest mass with your ratio of your speed to light. Well, actually, this is good. This is quite nice for... This is showing you coding is useful. So supposing you're studying this in physics, there's nothing better than coding up when you're studying something in physics or maths. There's nothing better if it can be coded up easily. There's nothing better than coding it up and putting sample values in and checking your understanding of everything. This, oh, this actually applies in a lot of engineering as well. If you can easily code something up, it can give you it can give you much better understanding of it in coding it and running an example. So maybe code and code up your physics and try them out. Uh, all right. So this is what I talked about. This is that chained if in abstract. This code runs if expression one is anything other than zero. This code runs if expression one is 0 and expression 2 is non zero so and this code runs otherwise so there are three pieces of code only one of them will ever run always one of them will ever run but only one of them so if expression 1 is non zero it runs not these two if expression 2 is non zero it runs but not those and lastly, if the expression 1 is 0 and expression 2 is 0, this runs. You can try that out. In fact, I wanted to code this up um, to, do, to do a program to, to, for the weather. All right. But work out what to wear based on the weather. We'll start again with uh, the... the, the Dice check program. We'll call it where 
Let's see. We'll make it accessible to the web server. And now we'll open it. It's not the only way to do this, but I can work with the same program. So I want to read in the current temperature and tell me what to wear. Um, with a number of possibilities. All right. Temperature. So we've already seen temperature. What do we use converting Celsius to Fahrenheit? We used a double. It's sort of an appropriate value for a temperature. A temperature can be a fractional number. Uh, so we'll say double into. Please enter outside temperature. Really, that's well. Does that misspelling matter? No, it won't. We'll leave it there. Just. To show you it doesn't matter because you know, it's it's just a message we're printing out. It doesn't matter what it's spelled. Well, it does matter to the person reading it, of course. All right, we're going to do something with the temperature, but we're not sure what yet. Let's just dump everything else. In fact, yeah, it's a good point. Let's let's compile our program and see if it manages to read in a temperature or not. We're getting a weird message from gedit. Tom says he thinks that's because it's an old version of gedit that should be updated, but let's just hide it. Let's compile it. Say so put the machine code in where. Let's see if it does compile. Some of you are spot oh oh no, no, so many things wrong. Alright. Oh. What is wrong? This all looks good. Oh my god. There's an error in user includes .io.h. That's the system include file. My whole system is broken. All right, one thing to do is if you get a pile of confusing errors, don't look at the last one. Often we get what we call as an error cascade. We create a problem. I did this accidentally, by the way. Um, it's not an uncommon thing to happen because of C syntax, but it's, this, um, there's an error cascade here. The first error has then led the compiler astray. It's got really confused. It's, it's an accidental, but it's a great example. So go back all the way. Ignore all the last errors, which are scary, and, and go back to the first error and see if that makes any sense. Error expected identifier or brackets. That doesn't make a lot of sense. And it's pointing at the slash. All right, we go to line one. And in deleting the comment, I just left a single slash. How will that compiler? How will our compiler be interpreting that slash? It'll be thinking as, as a divide. What happened there? The compiler then went to include studio.h, which which brings in printf. It tells us how it tells it how printf and scanf work. But the trouble was. It started into, into Stray or H expecting to be doing part of a divide. I don't know. It was just confused from there on. So it then gave me a pile of errors. It got being confused in there. But the real problem is just here in the first error. DCC tries not to do things like that, but that's one it doesn't get right. I go to the first error, fix that line, and suddenly. A lot of those errors should go away. And we're down to one error, which is a real error in our program. So it's saying correct values. Yeah, we forgot. For printf and scanf, if I want to, to either get in a floating point number or put it out, I say percent %lf, and it doesn't match. You're saying. Why? Why can't it just figure that out? Yeah, it's a good question. But, but C is not like that. Uh, for, uh, all right. So there's a correct program to read in a temperature. That should compile. All right, let's try and change some. I'm running out of time. All right. Let me try and put together a chained if that will help you out today quickly. 
So if the temperature is less than, say, what do we say, 15, what should I wear? Wear puffy jacket. I do have a down jacket. For, for me, it never gets cold enough in Sydney. I see students who come from places like Singapore and Thailand, and even in summer, they're wearing puffy jackets. So I guess it's a relative thing. We probably should have our program will customize it. it. Should you know what climate do you come from? Else, if temperature less than twenty, say one, we'll say printf. What do we do? Long sleeves. Yeah, wear long sleeves to go out. And else. What will I wear? I'll wear a t-shirt if it's I'm being pretty quick here. We're running out of time together today, but I want to finish off my program. I'm hopefully got a series of if statements that will put together. Yeah, what's the difference between else and else if? Else is all the other possibilities. Else if is only if this is not true and this is true. Let's 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 try it out. Let's save that, and let's, if I've got it right, I think I've got it right, but I've been wrong before. It compiles. Let's try out my program. All right, I think it's 14 degrees outside right now. Wear puffy jacket. So this evaluated to one. 14 less than 15. So this evaluated the one. So this was executed, but notice it didn't execute that or that. Notice this is true. Temperature is less than 21, but because this is true, this is executed, and then we say else if that do that. You should experiment with this uh, and, and try different versions. And let's try it. Oh, I didn't need to recompile. I haven't changed my program. But let's put in 45. Yeah, good advice. Wear a t-shirt if it's 45. And let's suppose it's 20 degrees. Sorry, let's run my program. 20 degrees. Long sleeves. Oh, there we go. <sighs> All right, I'm going to ask Tom for questions from the chat. But we, we only have about 30 seconds left today. But there's ifs chained together. So this is hopefully taking your tutor will work you th work through a series of questions in the tutor about if statements, clarifying any questions you have, any issues, getting you ready to work through a series of lab exercises, which start out hopefully really easy and finish it really, really hard with the hardest challenge exercise. So there should be something for everyone to play with and, and experiment with in the lab. All right, Tom, questions to finish off with. It would seem that the only questions are sort of kind of unrelated to exactly what we're doing. The only one that I think hasn't got a good answer is, um, is passing the order test an indication of full marks, which I'll give you a very quick answer, to which the answer is like, unless we've told you that the auto tests don't contain all the test cases we'll test you on, then almost certainly passing the auto tests is a good hint you'll get full marks. The one thing you've got to be careful of is that if your program is designed to literally just take in the test cases and print out the correct response, that's probably not going to get you full marks. But if your test case genuinely solves the problem and passes all the auto tests, that's a pretty good indication it will get full marks. So yeah, we, we tried to be nice to you. So we set out auto tests we think cover all the common mistakes, find all the common mistakes you might make, and tell you about all the common mistakes so you can learn and improve. There are students who instead exploit our kindness and say, I'll just I'll just write a program that passes the auto test then, and if they oh they're doing test one I'll pass that test two and they end up writing a program that does nothing but pass the auto test and you give it anything but the auto test it breaks, so we generally use slightly different numbers in the marking but for the lab exercises in particular we unless yeah unless you've deliberately tried to do this yeah passing auto test is good for for assignments. Um. 
and exams, yeah, we'll expect you to do testing and cover more unusual cases if you want a good mark. Yep. Um, the other thing to to say is, is there a limit to the number of statements we can chain together? And I think if this is a this is a good one where there's actually sort of uh, two answers for no, but you can only ever have one if statement at, in like a block because if statements always start a block of conditionals. You can have as many else ifs as you like because you could have an else if for, you know, one number and then another number and then another number, but you can only also ever have one else at the end. So you sort of have one if, many else ifs, and then one else. But then below that, you could start another if you wanted to. So basically, it's sort of, you can have as many else ifs if you like after an if. You can have an else after an if or an else if, but you can't sort of have two ifs that have sort of worked together or an else without an if. They wouldn't make sense. Try it yourself. You'll, you'll discover this. There are there are rare circumstances where you might have 20 or 30 conditions chained together. There's, there's a few ways to do that. Um, but emulators uh, are, are one place where you might chain a pile of ifs together. There are also rare circumstances like some of the challenge exercises in this week's lab oh. where you might chain it together. <laughs> uh, I believe it's 30 ish yeah. if statements is the best. Oh, yeah. Uh, all right. So. I sort of apologize. Well, no, I don't apologize for that. It's 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 it, it, it's a little stupid, but it's also interesting and challenging. Yes. All right. Thank you for joining me this morning. As I said, rug up, stay warm, and code away. Uh, I hope your Tutan Lab goes well this week. Uh, so we'll see you on Thursday at two o'clock for our next time together, where we get the exciting topic of loops. Uh, yeah. So we'll we'll dive into loops. All right, see you all then. All right, we're out.